Herzlich willkommen. I'm really amazed about, uh, about so, so many people because this evening we had the choice between Maurice Bloch and the competition between France and England. The soccer, uh, soccer competition. You, you, you don't, don't know? Yes, uh, I. Mean, you see, you're more popular. But I'm torn between <laughs> being French and English, so I just have to look away. Um, if you remember, in the last three lectures, I have been trying to argue that I've been talking about a little village in Madagascar. Uh, which is one of several in the forest, uh, a, a group of people called the Zephymaniri. I think I never gave their name. Here it is. Um, and so I, I mention it because I have problems with the, with the very name. Um, and what I've been trying to do is to discuss uh, an argument to explain why I think Anthropologists shouldn't use the notion of religion analytically, um, and why it is obvious. I hope I will try to make clear why it is obviously totally inadequate for what goes on in this little village, um, and use that as a basis for trying to understand when something that could be called religion uh, appears and why. So I'm still staying with this village. I love it, so in fact I would stay with it, whatever I can do. But um, I'm using it heuristically to try to make you imagine what it is like. Uh, why it, what it is like to have a system which in some ways superficially look what, like what we would in English or in French or in German call religion, but which it is actually misleading to call uh, in this way. And I'm trying to build it up little by little. And part of the argument was trying to say that in the very nature of the, that peculiarity of social relations, human social relations, the systems, the, the imaginary system that we call roles or that we call groups or that we call institutions, we have as much, if you like, of the supernatural uh, as um, things which would be more obviously called religious and that indeed they all form a single system. But that, that is not the social, it's one form of the social, which I've called the transcendental social. I don't want to, uh, it, it's an awkward word because it has all sorts of philosophical associations. I'm not asking you, uh, please forget them if you've read Kant and other people. Um, so I've called it the transcendental social and I've called the other system the transactional system, uh, sis, uh, social. Um, and what I've argued more, furthermore is that not only is this a distinction that I want to maintain analytically, but that it is a, a distinction which is present for people uh, in their lives, that they actually are aware of that distinction. Remember when I was talking about the old man uh, who at one moment can be seen, treated as an elder and at another moment can be treated as a senile old man and that one oscillates between the two uh, in very complicated kinds of ways. Similarly, when I was talking about Zephymaniri houses, Zephymaniri wood, one can see the house as a house, one can see the central post 
as a central post which holds up the, the house. One can see the hearth as a place where one cooks. Or one can see these, the post and the hearth becoming the ancestral man of the, of the marriage which sets up the house as part of a system which includes the whole village, indeed the whole countryside, the whole of the, the material vision uh, of the transcendental social system, anchored in geography, anchored in the material. So it's possible to see people and, it, and uh, things in those two ways. I'm going to pursue this to initiate a more theoretical discussion about the nature of belief and the nature of ritual. Um, in a sense, this duality, uh, which as I say, is real for people, obviously they wouldn't be talking in the terms that I'm talking about, they, 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 go, they live their lives and then give lectures in anthropology. Um, this duality can be seen particularly well when the, the house which instantiates the marriage, remember the marriage which has been this process which starts with kids playing at sex and ends when finally the man can bring his wife and his children to the house. It, it begins when that house is transformed. The central post is already there, made of the hard wood, the heart wood, um, which has been chosen in that relationship to bones, which I was talking about. That is then covered in taro paste. Taro is a, kind, is, 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 is a root which has great significance for, for the Zephyr because it's the last resource of food when everything has gone wrong uh, through war or through, through uh, um, infections. They then reciting various w words and spells, they cover the central post with, that, with the taro paste. They cover the um, stones of the hearth. Here is my little attempt at a hearth, and here is an attempt at central post. And then the central post is changed and becomes a part of the transcendental system. But of course, it's still seen as the central post. There's been no real change. Everybody knows there's been no real change in it. But it's possible to see it in one way or the other. Uh, and nothing shows it better than one goes through a ritual which makes it one thing, but of course never makes it really. It can be both, it'll still be a, a post, still be a hearth. Um, this is why material and material culture is such a problem, especially when it's in museums, because you can only see it from one point of view. Uh, in the museum, however good a little notice uh, which is attached to it. Well, you know, supposing you brought a Zephyrmanieri central post into a museum, and some of them are there because they're beautifully carved, it becomes a fixed one point of view thing. The ritual of instantiation of um, of the central post, therefore, shows us how the, the Zephyrmanieri themselves can change the point of view of that material object, knowing that it will only be like that for a particular uh, period of time. But of course, in the meetings after the death of the original couple that I was talking about last week, when people get together because there's been a quarrel in the family, then the central post becomes the man, the dead man, the ancestor, if you like, really becomes that, only to fit to become a central post later. The hearth becomes the original woman, 
the food cooked on it becomes the nourishment which comes from the union, the sexual union from that original couple. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to give you lots of details, ethnography from this place, but I'm going to give you a bit more ethnography about rituals, because of course the, the initiate, the instant, the, 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 the making of the house was, was part of the, uh, was a ritual. I, I'm not going to define the word, I'll, I'll define it later. Uh, but how another ritual um, can, in a sense, show the tie-up between the duality that is created in people uh, and the duality that is created in the material wood of the house, in the material objects. And that is the ritual of uh, circumcision by which male children are, give, are made double. They're made to be, some, to be members of the transcendental, apparently coherent system, uh, while, of course, they still remain the same little boy as they were before. So, again, you see the little boy, through the ritual of of, of circumcision is made as double as was the central post, transcendental, transactional. The words are useless, but I just need something or other which sort of fits in. And so how is this done? Uh, I've never just, I'm not going to great, go into great descriptions of that ritual. I wrote a whole book about it for another group, and it, the, the rituals of circumcision are much the same throughout Madagascar. But one of the things which really interests me uh, in, with the argument that I'm trying to make is how the ritual of circumcision is linked to the house. Uh, the, what basically happens is that during the night uh, preceding uh, the operation, there's lots of singing and dancing and excitement. And then at a key moment just before the operation, um, the young men, encouraged by, the, by young women, attack the house with spears. Uh, or anything else that they have to hand, sticks and so on. They dress up to look fierce. You remember the little children that I showed you dressed up with the sort of uh, peace sign on their face. Uh, they were playing at that ritual. They were playing at the attack that the young men make on the house. They go and, and the young men sort of really attack it. I mean, they, they, I've sort of seen houses half knocked down. They throw the spears into it, which is really rather a pity because they're often covered in beautiful carvings. And as a result of this attack, the child is taken out of the house. He's been sort of being danced around inside the house up to then and is placed on the threshold of the door, he comes out. Uh, on the threshold of the door, uh, his pre-pass is cut, is taken off, uh, much to his uh, displeasure usually. And then the child is welcomed by the whole village, but especially by the older men, all the elders, people like that old man I was talking about, outside. And then he's taken back into the house through the window uh, and, uh, and presented to the central post. And all, everybody goes back in. 
Now, you know, there are all sorts of sexual illusions. Uh, you can sort of see, you know, little boys coming out through the big door and then going back through a small door. If you can, uh, you can allow your imagination to, to run wild, if you like. Um, but the aspect that I really want to stress is that this shows extraordinarily well how one can look at the house one way and at another moment in another way. Because the symbolism of the house that is being attacked... I'm very sorry to interrupt, but we have to listen to your talk in the other room. Oh. Did you press any button? Because it seems to be coming through I, I, I've been... <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, 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 do you think it's this thing? Do you, think it's th do you think it's this thing I have? I've been given this thing. Could be. What do you think? Do you think it's... I'm so sorry. No, no, it's, it's obviously terrible news. You think you solved the problem? Yes. I hope. <laughs> right, but, but do no, I need no, that? No, no, just keep on, keep on going. All right. symbolical killing of the child, the child attached to the world of motherhood and of women, uh, and being separated by having the prepus removed. But he goes back into the house, which at that moment has become a holy house, a house which symbolizes the marriage, which is the key element in the transcendental social system of the Zephyrmanieri and is being presented to the central post. Uh, in other words, the house, in the interval of about half an hour, has completely changed in terms of its significance. But that significance is always attached to the materiality. <coughs> Not only is the house changed through that ritual, as it become from transactional to transcendental, uh, it, the child, of course, has also become changed by the operation. He's also become double like the old man. Uh, he's been duped, doubled in two ways. So I'm trying to, I use this example of this ritual, which I'm not going to go into detail over, to show you why I'm, I was linking up what I call the transactional uh, social uh, with the material that I was talking about last week. 
and how both those things are made possible by that human potential, that unique human potential that seems to be the development of pretend play or a particular form of imagination. Now, I've used words loosely, imagination, transactional, transcendental. I can't, uh, and I'm going to try to become clearer by what I mean, especially talking about the word imagination. Now, the word imagination is a very, very, very tricky one. Uh, even in psychology, it has a number of quite incompatible meanings. Um, and of course, when it is being taken from normal language into more uh, technical language and its use in uh, social sciences, all sorts of models um, occur. But I'm not somebody who believes in definitions very much. And I'm going to try to get you a feel of what I mean by the imaginary, by again working with the ethnographic in the way that I've been doing so far. But of course what I don't mean by the imaginary is something unimportant, untrue. Uh, I mean something linked with what we saw was going on with a little girl playing being teacher or a little boy using a banana as a telephone. Um, but of course, this being a resource for the building up of that system. So the ritual I now want to talk about is again, and again I'm hardly going to give you any details, is a variation of a ritual that you find throughout Madagascar. Uh, not well, nearly all Madagascar, of Madagascar. Uh, which is associated with what one might call honouring or uh, the, the dead, the ancestors. The dead or the ancestors, I don't know any distinction between those two words. Um, perhaps in its most famous form, uh, some of you, uh, some, one person here I know knows a lot about it. Uh, among the mariner, it's often, it, it's often been filled. It's, uh, it's a ritual by which uh, dead bodies are taken out of the tomb and then put back in, probably the most famous ethnographic fact about Madagascar. Among the Zephyrmaniri, uh, dead bodies are not taken out of the tomb. The tomb is just opened. Um, where the ancestors are. And the point of that, the main thing I want to stress first of all, is that it is an incredibly expensive ritual. People spend among large amounts of money. They're very, we're talking about very, very poor people. Spend large amounts of money large amounts of resources um, for that particular ritual. They have to save up for extremely, for a very large amount of time uh, because they invite large numbers of people. It's a very, very large party, uh, if you like, uh, which involves these massive expenses to which to a certain extent, all um, the people invited contribute, but some much more than others. So it's a massive thing to do. You don't do it lightly, is what I'm uh, stressing. Uh, several hundred people are present. Um, and the two main elements, I would say, are the present uh, so, uh, so first of all, one thing I should say is, why is it done? Well, there are a number of reasons. Some of them is, if you like, to honour a particular group of ancestors, usually a couple. 
um, because, and of course at the same time, you push up the prestige of your particular group, because if you could do that for, for the ancestors of your group, you could obviously increase your prestige. But also very often because um, disease or other forms of misfortune have occurred, and when those occur, a promise is made uh, to uh, the ancestors uh, that such a ritual will be done if they send their blessing in much the same way as the old man sends his blessing. And often that promise is made, but it's, you know, it's going to be so expensive, it takes a very long time before you get around to it. And the ancestors, in no uncertain term, remind uh, those people who made the, who made the promise they made the promise and they, you know, they, they remind them often by sending diseases and things like that. Um, you know, you made the promise, you better get on with it. So in the end, a long process builds up this massive ritual. In this ritual, uh, and therefore the, the, the ancestors are addressed saying, look, we've done it. Uh, we, are, we ask you for your blessing, we hope that you'll, you'll take away um, your nastiness that you sent us as a sort of reminder, um, all kinds of things that are said to them. And they are presented with cloth, often uh, shrouds, but also clothes, which is sort of sewn up. They're presented with money. Uh, there's a huge procession of girls comes along with the clothes, the shrouds, the money, goes, and it's uh, and at least the, the shrouds and some of the money is put in the tomb. They're presented with food, of rice, uh, and also cattle. Though so that is not put in the tomb. Um, because it's part of the other aspect of it, that it's a huge party where all the descendants take part, drink, eat, make very, get very merry, all sorts of activities go on, you know, flirting, more than flirting, um, jolliness, drinking, you know, everything goes on. So it's this huge party and it's very, very important because it's a party together with the ancestors. It's a sort of togetherness, a joining up of everybody. Um, the ancestors are thought often to be bored, cold, uh, lonely. Uh, and it's a response to that loneliness, to that cold to that boring that they're going to be given a great party with us and with everybody together. Um, and uh, a merry time goes on for two, three days actually. Now, if one thinks about this whole going on, um, there are some obvious inferences one could make. First of all, that the ancestors can hear since they're spoken to. That uh, they can eat since they're given food, drink equally, even in, in, among some groups that they can even indulge in sexual activity. That they want clothes. Uh, that they can be cold because one of the things they complain about often is coldness. That um, they can get angry when the promises are not fulfilled. That um, they know about what's going on. That they have moral involvement. You know, they don't like it when their descendants are act 
immoral, in the, in, more, I'm using the word moral in a special sense. So all these things seem obvious correlates of the activity of the uh, of this activity uh, having intentions of uh, all sorts of things about them or it seemed to be implied uh, and the same sorts of things would be found throughout Madagascar these ideas about ancestors somehow being implied in various activities even amongst fundamentalist Christians who believe that the ancestors are uh, uh, manifestations of the devil. Um, they still imply that they can do all these things and have all these capacities. Um, so, this raises the question, which is one of the questions that I want to talk about of what we mean by belief. Uh, I've said so far that this seems to be implied in the nature of the ritual. You know, if you speak to ancestors, it means they can hear. If you think they've sent you diseases because you've been a bit late in doing the ritual, it shows that they're impatient. Uh, if you give them food and drink, it shows that they can eat and drink. Um, Yet, what, was, what is meant by that sort of belief is the kind of question uh, which is very, very puzzling. As one knows, you know, uh, there's been a lot of work in anthropology, going back to Robertson, Smith and Durkai, uh, more recently the writers like Needham and Guillermo and so on, have been expressing have pointed out that the notion of belief is peculiarly linked to the Abrahamic religions. Um, that for these other religions, it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't, belief doesn't seem to be important to people. This would be perfectly true that the Zephyrmania matters is taking part in rituals. And unease with the very notion of belief uh, comes up again and again and again with anthropologists who work um, on uh, non-Abrahamic religion societies. I remember a, a clergyman, sort of soci sociologically inclined, uh, inclined clergyman in uh, Sheffield who felt that he really, um, I remember having this argument with him, he felt he wanted to know what the people who turned up every week in his church actually believed. And so he sent them a questionnaire, like sociologists do. Uh, and amongst the things, he asked them things like, which are in the creed, uh, which therefore presumably uh, his parishioners repeated every week, like, did they really believe in the afterlife? You got a terrible shock. Because, I mean, in England, to go to church regularly for a week is quite a weird thing to do anyway. So they really must have been people who were really committed because they were going there every week. Yet only, I think it was about 36% of them, all, as they were ticking off the um, questionnaire, said that they actually believed in the afterlife. Uh, what on earth was going on? Not only were they repeating it, but they were seen to be so committed to the, to, to, to the Christian church. And my, my argument with him was that, uh, that actually the question was just wrong. The question was just completely off the point as far as these people were concerned. Neither told them that they believed in the afterlife or they didn't believe in the afterlife. It was an irrelevant question to what religion actually meant for them. So the question was pushed on him by some of the theology which is associated 
which, was, uh, which is associated with the Abrahamic religion. But if one looked in a place like uh, Madagascar, where I worked, the inappropriateness of asking such a question would be, would be made understandable. And with this sort of uh, disease, disease about the notion of uh, uh, belief, a, a group of us who were working together, especially Masarita Astuti, uh, who's been working on these issues with uh, three or four of us, which includes psychologists um, and indeed a neurologist, uh, thought, well, we're just going to go and face this frontally. Uh, and Professor Astuti, working with Professor Paul Harris of uh, Harvard University, uh, tried to, first of all, adapt some work that Harris and a Spanish psychologist called Jimenez have done in Spain. Where they tried to work out, they've been trying to face this particular question, actually working with children, um, but uh, we weren't only really interested in children. Uh, I mean, Professor Studi wasn't just interested in children, they were interested in adults as well. What Harris had done, uh, what Harris and Jimenez had done, is ask informants in Spain. Uh, not just, you know, do, do you believe in life after death, but do you believe that dead people, dead relatives, try to always fix it with actual relatives, know what you're doing? Can they hear you when you say things? Um, and then, you know, more difficult ones like, do you think they can breathe in some sort of way? Can they eat things and so on? Um, I won't tell you about the results in Spain, but, but looking at sort of both uh, cognitive capacities, emotional capacities, are they angry when you misbehave, and so on, uh, and uh, what one might call sort of biological capacities. Um, the results on, in Spain were I mean, Harris and Imler's particularly interested in development of children. But they were, they were pretty surprising. And so Professor Stuti thought, well, let's just try this out in Madagascar, work, working with another group of people, and work, uh, group of people and work and see what happens. And she sort of set up an experimental situation where, again, somewhat similar to what Harris and Jimenez had done, she told people in that part of Madagascar uh, two different stories about the death of a, an imaginary person. Uh, one of the stories described this person, uh, sort of gave his age, his uh, what sort of person he was, but said nothing about family relations, and he actually uh, died in the hospital and gave quite a lot of details about what he died from. The other story was about somebody who died surrounded by his family, uh, with the appropriate rituals and practices which are done in Madagascar, uh, uh, death especially amongst these groups of people. Uh, so so two, two very different kind of contexts given to the death. And um, she then asked them questions rather like the Harris and Jimenez one. Um, do you think the person remembers, this was a man in both stories, remembers the name of his wife, remembers uh, the way to his house? Uh, are they angry when uh, his children 
misbehave, or they uh, sad uh, when um, other people die. Also things like, can they eat? Uh, could they digest? Could they defecate? Uh, can they hear? And so on. Now, one of the interesting responses, not all that surprising to, to any of us, because we knew we'd heard this sort of thing informally again and again. About 40% of people who answered in both for both scenarios, their response to these questions was, don't be so stupid. Dead people are dead, and that's it. <laughs> uh, Quite a lot, 40%. I mean, on all questions, it just came up with all these uh, answers. Um, and I've heard all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of things, you know, when people prepare clothes for the dead, they say, you know, we, we don't bother really to put buttonholes because, of course, you know, people can't, dead people can't put on clothes. Don't be stupid. <laughs> or they even laugh, they think it's a huge joke. That sort of thing. Um, when, they, when they give uh, offerings of rum all the time, uh, let's say, this is for the ancestors. You know, they can eat it up with the mud, I've heard people say in a joking way. So there's that. People did answer. Uh, the other 60% they gave, they said, oh, well, they can probably remember his name, his wife, they get angry, you know, but they gave all kinds of answers, but they didn't all fit together. There's complete sort of incoherence between the, the answers. Uh, you know, they seem to be no, you, know, you couldn't say that is the Zephyrmanieri's view about what happens after death. Notice just the problem that represents for anthropologists who love to say the so and so uh, believe such and such uh, and rarely count how many people told them that they believe this or that. Um, but there was a big difference between the two scenarios, the two stories. One of them is that. When the story involved the family and the rituals, much more faculties were attributed to the dead than the story about the man dying by himself in a um, hospital. But still, there remained an ex a contradiction, a really interesting contradiction that both Professor Astuti and I have been thinking about for quite a long time. And the contradiction is that all, her, all the people who responded are people who participate in these rituals. Indeed, spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of resources they go through all the actions of feeding the dead and so on, uh, of giving, giving clothes, of pretending that they are there with us as the party is going on. So how could one put these two very different types uh, of behaviours together? Well. We have a number of uh, 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 have a number of suggestions. One of the points to note is that in the questions that were being asked by by, by a student, the person was asked, "What do you think?" Now, if you think about it in normal life, about such matters. This is a rather odd and rare question, in much the same way as applies, you know, for this clergyman who sent, who sent uh, to his parishioners in Sheffield 
a questionnaire saying, what do you think about life after death? This is rather an odd moment in the normal religious life of people. You're asking something very odd out of a normal kind of uh, situation. But it turned out to be even more significant when we began to think about the nature of ritual. Now, if you ask people, why do you, why do you spend all this money? Why do you go to these rituals and so on? Why do you participate? They give you what appears at first to be two very, very simple answers. But simple answers are what we don't often think enough about uh, in anthropology, indeed, generally, um, in social sciences. The first one is, we must. This Malagasy has a very emphatic, we must. We must, so almost a kind of Kenshin duty kind of thing about it. Um, and you can try and push them, why must you? They, they, I mean, I've tried that very often. The answer is we must and must. It's our duty. Uh, a duty which, which is made clear relates to the whole social system around the obligations of others. And the other answer that people give, which I think is the one which I think may interest me most, for both of them, is it's our custom. Now, anthropologists tend to get very annoyed when their informants answer it's our custom. Um, they tend to want to say, well, come on, you know, it's a bit boring being told it's our custom. Full stop. Uh, but I think actually it's extraordinarily interesting. If you rely, if you reply to somebody, I, we do this because it's our custom. It means that you're saying the source or the guarantee of the truth that I'm going to propose for doing this doesn't come from me but it comes from somebody else. In other words, there is a displacement of the source of intentionality to somebody else. And not only that, uh, it's a, displace a displacement which implies a further displacement in a kind of endless regress. A very interesting kind of situation. But you're saying, look, it's not going to be me who is going to give you the reason. I am lying back on others who know why one should do this. But perhaps not so much important on why one should do this, but because I trust them. Uh, and in other words, what's being done in those rituals is an action of generalized Trust. And so the question, the original question in the Astuti text, is saying, why, you know, do you think the dead do, uh, do such and such a thing, is in certain extent the opposite of the situation of being in the ritual, where you're trusting others and following others. Indeed, the philosophical implications of this are very great. Big. Um, in other words, there's a saying, look, it's a different world that is being involved. I would link it up with my transactional and transcendental. Because notice, it's trusting other people, not as individuals when you're saying it's our custom, but in terms of their role, rather like it's trusting the old man when he's being an elder, not the old man when he's being a stupid, senile old man. So in other words, it's spreading, 
it, it's placing oneself in a, ne in a kind of network of trust within the transcendental system that I was talking about, which is, if you remember, one of the main points I was making and I've been making throughout, is the time-defined system, which therefore needs to be separated from the endless transactions of the instant. Cannot, it cannot be one which is in any way linked to perception. It has to be and this is why we use the word imagination. It, cannot, it has to be broken, the, the link between perception and conceptualization has to be, uh, has to be, uh, has to be uh, broken. And this uh, leads me to, this led me uh, 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 to look more at this notion of this kind of generalized trust within a system, a kind of placing oneself within the transcendental system, which remember, remember is people seen in one way, houses seen in one way, the countryside seen in one way. And I found helpful the discussion of this process, uh, which originates with the philosopher Hilary Putman, which he, when he discusses something that he calls deference. Uh, and one of the deference being exactly that, acting in a particular way, not because one knows, one seeks in oneself the guarantee of its appropriateness or its truth, but one is just deferring to other people uh, in order uh, who one assumes one can trust, and who may be the source of, uh, of the truth, otherwise but that may be further removed because they would be deferring to other people who defer and defer and defer and so on. Now what's particularly interesting about this, especially for me, is that it seems to be the basis of a fundamental aspect of the social. The example which Putman gives is uh, and I'm changing it slightly. He says, look, I go to a jeweler and I'm trying to buy a wedding ring. I say, dear jeweler, can you show me your good wedding, your good gold wedding rings? And I choose the one I like. But how do I know it's gold? I'm not going to take with me a little chemistry set to go and analyze whether it's actually gold. And I am usually, I am, and probably most of you, are totally unable to tell gold from things which look like gold. But on the other hand, I'm not uh, laying myself open to paying for just any old yellow metal. And the reason why I'm not is because I trust that the jeweler is acting in terms of his role. There are all kinds of guarantees about this, you know, but where the shop is, what I know about the legal system, about how jewelers relate to other jewelers, how, how uh, I'm actually lying, relying on a complex social system. Notice again, it's a social system which has very little to do above the very specific jewel. Perhaps I've chosen one that I know, a friend of mine, but most of the time we don't. We just go to a reputable jeweler as a jeweler, part of that complex system. Now, if you think about it, this is how we act normally. Most of the time, we don't act in terms of good reasons for acting in a particular way. Uh, we don't do, th do things because we know we've tested out all the possible ways of doing things. We're continually relying on other people, or what I would call the transcendental system. Notice the example of the jeweler is rather nice because it has both the materiality and the role tied together in a rather similar way to what you get um, in the, in the Zephyr image. That I'm talking about. You know, the look of the 
the, the, the material appearance of the shop, its position, and so on, is all part of it, even the way the work is dressed. Um, so, if you think about that we actually rely on deference to be able to have our ordinary light, I think one can uh, understand uh, much more of what is the significance of what is going on in that ritual. It is accepting another, a trans what I've called the transcendental system. And it also explains when it is that people are most likely to be involved in rituals. Not entirely, but some, but many of the important ones. The examples of the rituals that I've been talking about are originally initiated because things go wrong, because of disease in a very broad sense, that is, people are quarrelling within the family, somebody has got some terrible disease, you know, they're getting thin, don't understand why, and so on. So the sequence goes, you have this, you ask the blessing of the ancestors, this, um, you say at the same time, you know, a bit of bargaining, and say, well, we'll do the ritual sometime. You don't really, because it's too expensive, too complicated. And then you ask them two or three times, and after a while, they uh, come and ask you for it in the, in, in the dream, and then you, you are really have to do it, because then you know you have in really bad trouble. Uh, so in other words, it's moments when you've given up your own individual resources, you know, your own, the way you can sort things out. Uh, Evans Pritchard describes that rather nicely in his discussion of witchcraft, which is so well known. You know, the people don't sort of begin to think it's witchcraft when something goes wrong. They try things out and then they must then seek a further explanation. This is very much what happens. So in other words, what people are doing is lying back. I, I, I like the sort of thought of lying back on the system of trust and deference which is quite a different kind of system of truth uh, and understanding, which is that social system of roles, of houses, of wood, of carving, of countryside, and so on. An alternative one. They know that it's at certain moments that you do this. It's a different answer, a different not a different answer to the same question, but a different type of answer to the questions uh, Astuti was asking. It's, you see, it begins to be an answer about social relations. We must do it. Uh, it's the custom. I think the term, the custom, is an extraordinarily profound one, which we really need to think about. So what I've been trying to show you is how that what I've called the transcendental system is something which people are aware of as an alternative, as something which they can play on, a point of view which they can oscillate on. As the, you know, the point of view, one moment is the old man who is senile, one moment is the elder, one moment it's the post which holds up the house, one moment it's, it, 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 it's, the, it's the founder of the house. Um, and this is more as well I want to say about that particular topic, but just let me finish by explaining why uh, I don't consider religion as an analytical, uh, as a useful analytical tool to go back to one of the points I was making in the first lecture. In a system like this, talking of religion, assuming that there is a a circumscribable type of beliefs, separate from the fact of recognizing people within their role, separable of what we call kinship systems, separable of what we call houses, is just misleading. It's dissolved in something much, much more fundamental. 
which is an aspect of the social, but not the whole social, because remember the transaction is taking place. And the reason why I'm coming back to this point here is because the next three lectures will be trying to understand what happens when something which is much closer to our English or German or French meaning of the word religion begins to separate and what uh, the kind of problems and potentialities this creates. So the next lecture will be about the state and religion like that.